The Dailies, every day on Core TV News. Thanks for joining us again. Let's quickly find out what the top stories are on some of Nigerian dailies. As usual, I have the Vanguard, the Nation, the Punch, as well as the Guardian newspaper. But yesterday was International Women's Day, and the theme was Make It Happen, another avenue to celebrate and recognize achievements of women around the world. And I have here with me on set the Director General of Kudarat Initiative, uh, Awareness. Now, let me get that name quite well on this tab. And I believe she's also a gender activist, no doubt, but as well as a director general of the Kudarat Initiative for Democracy. Did I get that right? Kudarat Initiative for Democracy, yes, and it's executive director. <laughs> as executive director. Thank Good morning, Ebi Oyewale. Thank you very much for finding time to join us today. Good morning. How are you? And I also want to add that you are one of those um, very few courageous women who visited Meduguri uh, on a fact funding mission. Yeah. You want to tell me a little about that? Well, um, this was last year in May, uh, although we do have another one planned for this year. Um, and it was just because of, of all the things that were going or happening, the abduction of the girls. But Kind had always worked in Midugri and we had someone there and we thought that it was necessary and important to visit and to see for ourselves what was going on, but more importantly to meet the women and the girls who had been undergoing different um, uh, conflicts and dealing and how they were dealing with it. And the reason being was because we wanted to have a first-hand information and just be, to be able to plan our programs accordingly. Did it go with any form of protection, security no. personnel? No, I mean, we're... I mean, I don't know what we're feeling like. We're well, you're feeling... at any time scared that um, probably was a life or death, you know, trip you were making. Well, we had kind of called around and they had told us, oh, it was okay. But of course, I mean, we're human beings. We were petrified because we had mm. to go first to Kano. And then from Kano, we took, um, uh, went by road from Kano to Meduguri about six and a half hours or so. It was a very long and tedious journey. And every step of the way we saw uh, um, police, uh, the military combined security forces. But more importantly, we saw the decimation of what Boko Haram had done. We had, on the road, we saw some places that were bombed out. We saw some shelters. And it was just very, very, you know, it brought it home to us that this is really real. You know, this is not um, some uh, propaganda. This is, these are people that are. Well, you were lucky not to have confronted Boko Haram as a sect itself. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, we were praying every day, and to be honest, we were like, but it, it, it was not so much as only Boko Haram, it was also mm. the military forces, mm. because there's a lot of suspicion and a lot of uh, anxiety and tension in the ground, there's a lot of, uh, you know, we don't know who is who, so one of the points that we got to, almost when we were about to enter uh, Meduguri, we were stopped, and at that point in time, we were tired, we were exhausted, and they were telling us to bring uh, ID cards and a uh, passport, and we we're like, well, are we going to Chad? What is it? At that point, they were like, come down, mm. get down, mm. you know, and this was military and police, and I was like, ah, is this for real? And at that point in time, I was scared. I was, we were Ah, no, 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 we just want to, you know, I, they were, anything could have happened, mm. really and truly. But mm. at that point in time, we just kind of made it, that not just Boko Haram, but even also the military forces, there's so much, you just, in a, in a situation of conflict, mm. you need to be careful. And we were just two women, we didn't take any police, we didn't take any, we, we the man that was supposed to go with us, he chickened out at the last minute. How long, how long did you spend there? We spent five days. Five days. You're married, I believe. Yes. What did your husband feel about it? I remember when I told him that, oh, I have to go to my degree. He looked at me up and down and he said, I have to call your mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. But my husband was very supportive. He mm. helped me with the children and look after them. But more importantly, he helped me to hide it from my mother because mm. I didn't tell my family that I was going. And uh, he was calling me every point. How is it? How is it going? Take care of yourself. Don't do anything rash. I think more importantly, he knows what I do and 
why I want to do it. Mm. And he said, well, you are the one that wants to be a <laughs> save the world, so go ahead. What were your observations and what have you done with those observations thus far? Well, of course, the first point of call was to discuss with um, various stakeholders, various stakeholders, women, girls, um, and uh, people that were in authority. So we met a lot of uh, commissioners. Uh, we even met with the first lady of uh, Bono State. Um, of course, there were different variations of the story, but I would give you our, uh, our, what we've done in, in, in different ways. The first was the people, the women who we've met. Some of them were victims of violence. They had gone through um, very horrific uh, ordeals. They had seen their loved ones being killed in front of them. Some of them had been sexually uh, um, abused mm, and, and were molested. Um, one, one girl in particular, she had had um, the stomped in her chest. Mm. And this was a year ago, and she still hadn't received any treatment. And when she coughed, she kind of still coughed up you know, blood, and she still had pains. And so, of course, the immediate was medical care. Um, talking to them about what they went through, um, some of them don't have any, didn't have anywhere to stay. Their houses had been bombed out, they had been burnt, um, and so one of the most important things we did was come back, um, gather people around, you know, gather resources, money to build their houses. And they, a few houses is not a lot. Um, what again was probably most important was how to work with government okay. um, and different agencies on how to help women in particular. Mm -hmm. I say women in particular, but that doesn't mean that men did not go through or men and boys haven't been affected. But of course, you know that our own focus is women. And so right now we are supporting about 20 women with small businesses, um, medical care, um, and we're looking at how we can expand. She don't expand on that. Amazingly, Medigiri is in the news again, and I think we should start from the Vanguard newspaper this morning. Uh, you see battle against Boko Haram, hmm. Chad, Nijay, launch air ground strikes in Nigeria. And the writers here, troops recapture Boni Yadi from terrorists. It's joint battle fought from many fronts. That's what the defense headquarters are saying. Careless talk by MJTF partners, worry military. Now, the front page picture on the Vanguard this morning, if we can have it on the screen, okay, of the Vanguard. Is that the Vanguard newspaper? I think that's a wrong newspaper you're portraying from there. Let's check the Vanguard newspaper. The front page picture of the Vanguard newspaper shows uh, Medjugorje attack victims. Victims received treatment for injuries sustained following a bomb blast in Medjugorje. That was yesterday. Mm. It's amazing, however, how at one hand we seem to be winning the war against terrorism, what they call the regional force attack. Mm -hmm. But then the excuse the military is also given is that now that we are taking back territories from Boko Haram, mm. they seem to now go back to their initial uh, alternative, so to speak, of suicide bomb attack. How long more do you see us probably preferring a lasting solution headlong to this challenge? Well, the question is how long? I mean, it's, it's a long time. I think we have, we're have in it for a long haul. The reason being is this didn't start when the girls were kidnapped. It didn't start when Buni, uh, the, the children in Buniyati were killed. Yeah. It started way before, and it's, some of these things have already, um, I, you know, when they have settled in a certain area. Conflict or terrorism, as you know, is, a ongoing, is an ongoing war, yeah. not just in Nigeria, but in many other places. What it needs is political will and a committed force to fight it. What I, what I find very, very, very uh, frustrating about Nigerian um, uh, government and the way we're doing it is, on one hand, you know, you, you, today you put your military forces and you fight uh, take Buniyadi or you take a Waz Goza or you yeah. take a... But then you leave it open. And then they go back there. You forget that these people, they live there, uh, the, the terrorists, that's where they stay. They have already, they have found places that they are. And you need to get intelligence report and work to effectively fight it. But it is not just fighting with military and war. It is also building the capacity of the people. Because at the end of the day, it's these people that either have about them, keep them, protect them, or even join those forces. You need to make it disattractive or unattractive for people to say, oh, um, I will join Boko Haram and things like that. Mm. It's an all-out uh, uh, strategy. Let's check out the front page of the nation newspaper this morning. Uh, Bono Blast death toll now 62, and also the nation has another uh, quite um, pathetic front page picture. You see where they wrote here, 
a bloody weekend on the mm. front page of the nation is but the front page picture shows a mother sitting with her child at a state hospital as it receives treatment for injuries sustained following a bomb blast on saturday that left dozens dead and many injured in Meduguri. and then you see also a child victim of the blast at the hospital and more victims of the bombing yesterday uh, and you, you know there is also this category of people called the internally displaced persons oh yes how would you describe the welfare and what the government has been able to do over time with these people currently um in the six states of uh, uh bornu taraba yobi adamawa and i forget the other two there are about 1.5 million people who are currently 1.5 million and counting that are currently displaced according to um uh, nema nema is trying his best with regards to providing relief materials um, but as you know we never planned for this kind of things and so in some places in some facilities they are you know oversaturated with people and in truth that those numbers are not even numbers that we can really say categorically oh this because many people when they're displaced they move on mm. to different places many people have moved to Lagos um, the situation is pathetic the situation is very very critical at this point in time and I uh, would enjoy many Nigerians as much as possible if you can support please do but NEMA is trying uh, not just NEMA but uh, several other agencies as well there are also concerns about how to engage those people uh, and not get them disenfranchised ahead of the 2015 general elections uh -huh. is that a possibility I don't know about this particular elections mm. because you see nobody planned for 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 um, for uh, displacement uh, last week we were in a meeting where we were talking about developing a policy for IDPs IDPs are uh, internally displaced people and one of the critical things that we were talking about was uh, the possibility of them displaced people internally displaced people voting mm -hmm. and being voted for of course let us leave being voted for for now but even just voting uh, many of them have been displaced from where they registered. Many of them don't even know uh, 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 the PVCs. I don't know how it will work for these particular elections. I think that there were plans on ground for people who were in camps to vote. I don't know. I need to kind of be clear about that. But, but for this election, um, let's just get through it. You know, apart from the logistics and structures, do you really think these people are interested in voting? There's a possibility of voter apathy setting in because um, it's a point of survival now, a point where probably the only thing on their mind is getting their lives back. Do you think that um, they have that um, education of understanding the relationship between who leads them and the survivor at the start. You forget that internally displaced people are you and me. Mm. It can be you and me. Mm. Right now we are sitting down here, we are driving our cars. Tomorrow, God forbid, something happens, a natural disaster, conflict. We can, you and me can be displaced. And of course, I would like to put you in their shoes. If you were in that position, would you not want to vote? And the reason why you want to vote is not so much as, oh, it's your survival. The reason why you want to vote is that whatever put you in that situation, and whatever treatment you have received prior to the time that you're voting, it would make or break you, so to speak. If you are somebody that was, you had your house, your children, or going to school, and all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, you are not there, you are living in camps, in, in squalor, you would want to vote because you want to make sure that your leaders understand that you are a person, you are not a statistic, you are a human being with feelings, and you have a right, like every other person in this country, you are a citizen of Nigeria. You would want to make sure that your, 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 your rights are protected and met. And so I think, in truth, many of them want to vote. Okay. When we went to Borno State, when, when we met many people, there was, there was so much anger. There was that much anger because they just didn't understand why they were going through what they were going through. They didn't understand why they would wake up in the morning, they don't know whether if they leave the house they will come back alive. Mm. They didn't get it, they didn't understand why they, they seemed to have been forgotten. Mm. And so they were very, very angry that, no, we are citizens, we are not another, uh, we are not Chad, even Chad, they treat their citizens better. So it, I think that it is very important and very imperative that they... Do. Let me take your opinion on these um, Headline, APC petitions ICC over First Lady's hate speech. There is an allegation that the First Lady was um, quoted to have um, asked electorate to throw stones at the opposition. Uh, we've not gotten videos to confirm that particular allegation yet. But how will you describe the role of the office 
of the first lady of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Many have debated that it's unconstitutional. Uh, do you see that role playing a critical uh, uh, role in helping the Nigerian woman, so to speak? It's a very delicate question that you ask me because I am, uh, um, on one hand, a, a woman uh, activist. On the other, I, we promote women, and we use every channel possible. In in years past, or in uh, authorities past, the the office of the first lady has been very critical to promoting our work. It has been very critical to saying women are equal citizens. Women should participate equally and it has been very critical i mean i take you back to the years of um, uh, military regime uh, mariam babangida and um and the likes where they started the whole better life program now as we progress we see that it is evolving and changing and the question to whether it is constitutional or not of course i'm not a legal expert and my legal colleagues will say uh, yes i come from the point of view that every little helps every little office opposition helps. I believe that the role of the office of the First Lady is critical to the development of certain certain structures, mm. to the development of, be it as you may, women and girls, but not just that, but in Nigeria as a whole. I think that is an office that should be handled with care, whoever is there, whether it is the current First Lady or any other First Lady coming in. Now, regarding the issue of hate speech and, and things like that, the National Human Rights Commission has been very clear in their campaign and and we know that all the time that you know in nigeria people always think that politics is a do or die affair you know they come out and they make enemies and they say all sorts of things because there's no accountability there's no transparency the national human rights commission is very clear that they would take up anybody any politician any of authority figure that propels or uh, pushes for hate speech. In truth, anybody that does that, first lady or not, should be ashamed. Yeah. You shouldn't. It's politics. It's not. You you are not there for life. So if today Nigerians themselves are making up their mind or are trying to choose or are trying to say, look, we don't want this person, we want this person. It's their choice. I think that is the right of every person to make a choice. It's not something that should be thrust down our throat. We're not stupid. So I think that if indeed she did say that then it's a very, very grievous offense, if indeed. I don't know. I don't know whether it is uh, a hearsay or, or whatever, like you, I'm yeah. still trying to find out the facts. One of the selling points of this administration will be that um, they claim to have more female participation in government than every other uh, former or past administration in Nigeria. They call it the 35% affirmative. Do you see that as uh, a logical plus to the women folk in Nigeria? Fact. Fact is, this administration has, in fact, done quite a bit for women in terms of putting women in key positions. That is a fact. It's not disputed, or it cannot be disputed. Fact, it is not only at that particular position, which is the federal level, mm. that it would now automatically translate to, oh, now we have more women, so therefore, bam, everything has changed. No. It is supposed to be at all levels. And this administration has shown very clearly that, yes, they have tried to put women in, in several uh, positions. I think it is a plus for women and for Nigerians in general, women in particular, but Nigerians in general. Is that a selling point for this particular administration? I suppose that whether it is the PDP or APC that is the government or any other party, they would use it as a selling point because now many people have realized the power of women or the power attributed to women in the sense that women make up 50% of the voting population. Women are 50% are, are of the population in general, not even just as voters. So it's important that we begin to take cognizance of women and begin to tell women that, oh, we can do this for them. Have this, this appointment practically important? impacted on the welfare, the well-being, taking a larger chunk of women away from the poverty level? Has it uh, in any way impacted positively on the average Nigerian woman? Well, the research is still out on that one. I would say that um, it has gone on, it, the appointments have shown or like before, in, 2000, in 1999, when, when you look at women in politics, you can only count, or women in leadership, you can only count one or two. It has gone to show that women, when, are, when 
given the opportunity or when put in certain positions can lead it has almost or it is almost beginning to change the perception of women themselves as leaders but also of people like men and women mm. and on women has it changed women's situation not necessarily not necessarily but I, like I said, it is not just putting women in leadership automatically that changes it. Does that further affirms the school of thought that it really does not matter what gender occupies one political seat or not? For instance, the APC on the contrary claims that it's the only party that is fielding a female uh, gubernatorial candidate in the forthcoming 2015 election. Does it matter whether the governor is male or female? to necessarily impact positively. Research has shown that people. where you have women in polit political participation, where we have women involvement in political participation, the development of that country has changed significantly. Look at the Scandinavian countries. They have more women in politics. They almost have 50%. They are doing much, much better. Rwanda, where they have women that are almost well, almost 50 percent as well they are doing much better so yes because the reason is when you have women occupying strategic positions they're able to bring policies they're able to shed and bring a different light so your question of does it matter yes it does matter as a woman i would like to go to work i would like to know that my children who for some reason all of you have put it on my head that i'm the one that <laughs> takes care of children are taken care of i would like to know that i have better daycare for my children where i work i would like to know that i have better medical facilities for my children i would like to know that i have equal wages with a man so yes it does matter are the nigerian women ready for this political challenge because obviously from the statistics it's still not balanced so to speak I don't think the question is, are the Nigerian women ready? I think the question is, are Nigerians ready, period? The question is, are Nigerians ready for, let me not use that word, but are Nigerians ready to take their development to a, a level that they are comfortable with? Are Nigerians ready to see the right people in position? Are Nigerians ready to challenge certain stereotypes and status quo that they keep on shoving down our throats? And I think the question, the answer is yes. For instance, there are about 14 presidential candidates for the 2015 election. I'm not sure if any of them is a woman. There is one woman. Just one. Dr. Remy Shonaya of Koa mm -hmm. Party. In fact, we joke about mm -hmm. it that we, she, she, she is the only, and I actually learned that too as well last week, that she's the only, she's the first female political uh, presidential aspirant. In the past, no, presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. In the past, we've always had aspirants. Sarah Jibri was an aspirant, but she never got the party. Do you recall what transpired in that primary election where she only had one vote? I think that, you know what, it is an uphill task and an uphill battle for women to take that position. I read somewhere that they said, oh, when you have women on board, it's a moral and an ethical thing. The truth about it is I don't think it's so much as moral or ethical because you hold women to a different standard that I don't even understand why. We exist in an ecosystem where, oh, of course, it's strife with corruption and all sorts of things. So why do you hold women to a different standard? Oh, women will bring... No, you should agree that you have something to offer. I have something to offer as a woman. And we should all be given equal opportunities. The fact that Sarah Jubil was the only, only had one vote, there was, it meant that there was a lot of work to be done. Women sometimes, when they come in, they think, oh, because I'm a woman, I can ride on that ticket. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to also know your audience. You have to also pull your weight. You have, you have to also know what the issues are and how you want to adequately deal with it. You have to have an antecedent. The truth about it is that in many places where you have women that are over 30% or 50%, there was some sort of affirmative action. There was a quota or there was an affirmative action. In Nigeria, we have tried to do it in a way that, oh, women on merit. We've tried to do it in a way that, oh, um, you are a female aspirant, go there. But there are many challenges. And so what I'm saying is that we need several strategies and approaches to get there. If you get to that point where it is not an aberration to have a woman as a gubernatorial candidate, it is not an aberration to have a woman as a presidential candidate, and people come out and say, you know what, there's candidate A, candidate B. Candidate A said she, would, said she would do this, said he would do this, and they have done it because we have seen where they have shown it. Nobody would say, nobody would bet an eyelid that, oh, it's a woman. It would be, she's the best candidate, let her go. Why does it have to be that, oh, it's a woman, she can't do it? And I, that is my argument, and I always wonder that, when would that change? 
whether in my lifetime, I'm not sure. Have you been able to identify the challenges, really, that have been responsible for uh, uh, the very, probably, let me use the word, insignificant, so to speak, participation of the Nigerian woman in politics. For instance, on the show this morning, I insisted that I wanted a woman on the show. And there's a particular woman that has always been coming. So I told my producer, no, I want a different name. I want a different face on the show. But then the guy tells me I keep calling them and then they are not available. I keep <laughs> calling them and then I can't find them. I mean, it looks as if even when we have a platform to showcase the woman, that's 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 one thing. The other challenge is getting women to come and participate. What have you been able to identify the challenges, really? Well, you've mentioned uh, several challenges. Mm. Women themselves sometimes are just not available, or they don't know when opportunities present themselves and how to take it. But you know what? I want you to look at it holistically. Someone called me the other day, mm -hmm. said, oh, he wants me to be on a, a radio station. Of course, it was lastminute.com, mm -hmm. like, oh, he called me tonight and he wants to be there tomorrow. And I, okay, what time? And he goes, 7.30. And I'm like, excuse me, <laughs> you can't. I have to take my children to school. I have to get them up in the morning. I have to, and then I have to think about, sometimes it is easy for men because they don't have to think about all these things. Or if they even have to think about it, it's almost quite... Oh, no, you take, you, you take the child. And so sometimes some of these challenges are interesting. Some of these challenges we can't not but think about it. But let me tell you what happens in countries or in places where they think about those challenges. They make provision. I'm coming here, okay. Oh, well, maybe there will be a bus to take you and your children. Maybe there will be daycares. You, are, you have to work. There will be daycares for your children downstairs where it wouldn't be too far away. Um, maybe we can pay for nannies for your children. Or maybe we, those are ways that you think about overcoming challenges. It is hard, it is very unrealistic for you to think that, oh, let us do what the men do, but let us not think about how we can mitigate those challenges that women deal with. Men don't really have to deal with many of the challenges. They only wake up in the morning, dress and go, you know. Well, some men, not all men, my husband <laughs> does a bit. But those are the issues, and that is the real thing that we have to deal with. That's the real cocoa. When women have to think about when they have, to, they are dealing with all these issues. Some women are caretakers. They take care of aged parents. They take care of children. They take care of family. They take care of so many things. And then you expect them to. So sometimes, in a scale of, in a hierarchy of needs, being involved in political participation or being involved in leadership is not on their scale of, it's not on their scale of needs because it's like, I have all these things to do. Let me. Do Let's also this. consider the African tradition factor here because I think that's also playing itself out. I will look at a situation whereby probably traditionally uh, the woman is not supposed to uh, 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 worry herself about politics. You did not just say that. No, 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 just a minute. Because I, I was shying away from that, but you brought it in now. Because are we looking at a situation whereby we're going to have a change in cultural structure before we can have women folk available for such positions? Well, since you have put it that way, let me go to where you're going. <laughs> First and foremost, culture is not, statistic, it's not static. It is not stay, this is culture and then finish. That is it. Culture is continuously and constantly evolving based on our situations and our way of life. And our way of life is constantly and continuously changing. There was a time that people were living in caves. Now people are living in glass houses. So that is culture. Secondly, there is no, and if you want to go traditionally, let's go traditional. Okay. Traditionally, women occupied certain positions. And you, of, it's, it's, history is strife with those kind of stories. Queen Amina of Zaria, uh, of Zazo, the, um, the Igbo culture, there are women who occupy certain things. There were certain things that were not done until the women have sat and met and discussed and deliberated and said, let it be. Now, along the line, we have lost those important values or places where women used to be and we have become very a, a, a culture that oh we don't remember the strength of women or the, the 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 contributions that women made and we have relegated them to the background yes we are getting to the point whereby we are challenging those stereotypes and those cultures mm -hmm. and it is not a traditional thing that women there are many women who are female headed heading their households they don't have any men due to one thing or another maybe we do also. But they're heading their houses and they're doing fine. There are women and women who run businesses and run successful businesses at that. We only are saying that while we are seeing those changes or those leaps and bounds in, 
economy, in social life, it is yet to translate to political life. And of course, we know the reasons why it hasn't translated. Many people view, both men and women, view politics as dirty. Right. They view politics as something that, look, uh, please, I don't even want to go in there. I won't touch you with a 10-foot pole. For several reasons, you have seen, we see it every day on the papers, we read how politics can be. And many people would rather like, oh, let me take myself away from that. I saw where you're coming from. But, but let's quickly also focus on your organization. What, what would you identify as the Kudirat initiative for yes. democracy? For instance, someone would say that was Kudirat herself actively involved in politics? If she wasn't married to MK Wabiola, would she have gotten that kind of prominence and recognition? Uh, was it a was it just an activism, a reactionary uh, political relevance, so to speak? Many people go into politics for different reasons. The truth about it is that one of the challenges that we all, particularly women, find is that we are not politically engaged or we don't understand what politics is. The truth about it is that everything in life is about politics. One day somebody will wake up and tell you, don't wear this, this monkey suit, go and wear that wearing traditional from Monday to Friday. Everything is political. And we tend to not understand the differences. Many people are, are drawn into politics for one situation or another. Kudrat herself was drawn into it, maybe yes, because her husband went to political participation, but she was, in, in every definition, a politician. Because politics is about understanding the different powers that be. Politics is about broken, uh, 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 bringing some sort of uh, uh, need for people and meeting those needs. And she had, she met those needs, whether it was fighting for her husband to be released or saying that, oh, for three weeks we wouldn't have patrol until certain things are done. That's politics. Look at it and check it. Unless those, nobody is born a politician. Everybody stepped into it to say, oh, there's a need that needs to be met and I think I can meet this need. Do I have the quali qualities ready? Yes, I do. Let me go into it. And it's a constant learning and, and a, so she was a politician. She continues to epitomize the kind of women that we want to see in leadership. Women who might just be ordinary housewives, or I won't call anything housewife ordinary, there's nothing ordinary about housewife, but, or traders or something, who just say, you know what, there's something there, there's something wrong, let me go. Let me quickly open the phone lines if we can get a couple of calls. I'm also interested in female calls because that's another thing. You host a show for five days in a week and then you hardly get three female callers across Nigeria. Let's take calls and find out what you believe are to be the challenges um, affecting women participation in Nigerian politics. But the rescheduled elections are just about 19 days to go. Yes. And of course we know that there are fewer women who are actively uh, have shown interest or who have been given the candidacy to be voted for. But how would you describe the role of the women folk? Because um, unfortunately too, what we've seen women actively participate in is um, the party, uh, the partisan politics mm -hmm. where they dance mm -hmm. and then you know mm -hmm. that they are being paid to do certain mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Do you see women voting really? Uh, or let me put it this way, what do you see influencing the female votes in this election? Well, first and foremost, um, there are actually more women contesting in this election than there have been in the last two elections. Okay. I also learned that, which is, which I thought, oh no, there are more, less women coming up, but there are more women contesting um, at different levels. Now, the elections have been postponed and women are working towards, you know, they are actually trying to get their PVCs. Mm -hmm and come out to vote. The challenge is not so much as women should vote for women. Okay. People automatically assume also that, okay, I'm a woman candidate, so you vote for women. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Mm. And because I, I guess it's a, also a case of, you have to convince me as a voter why I should vote for you, whether you're a man or a woman. Mm. That's me though. I can't speak for the other population that are voting, but for me, you can't just come and say, ah, vote for me, I'm a woman, therefore I'll bring the women votes. Ah, I'm educated, I understand. I engage you on the issues. Right. So how would you address this? How would you address that? And many candidates, not just women, but men that come forward, do not know how to address those issues. Right. And that is a sad reality. And sometimes when people, women and men go to vote, it's just to, okay, 
I know this party. Who is this one? I don't know this one. Okay, I vote for this one. I vote for this one. And that's how it works. That's all right. We'll get the phone line very quickly. When you're calling in, and able to turn down the volume of your TV set so we can have a crystal clear communication. Now, don't forget that there is a lead to delay between what we say here and what you hear on your Star Times device. So ensure that your TV set is mute. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Call Digest. Hello. What's your name? Hello? Hello, good morning. What's your name and Hello. where are you calling from? <laughs> Afolabi, can you turn down the volume of your TV set? All right, please go ahead with your contribution. I just want to greet you. Uh, I don't want to greet you on the program. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Afolabi. Really, would, would, don't call me to greet me now. You can call me later on. But let's find your, <laughs> let's find your, let's find out your contribution on the issues we've been discussing on this show. Now, of course, there are also issues as regards um, beyond actively going out to vote. Because um, you also have been able to establish some of those factors uh, that have hindered women to participate uh, as candidates. But now, the issues of going out to vote, the issues of the family, there's every possibility that probably the woman will vote who the husband is voting. Is that mm -hmm. a reality as well? No. My husband and I completely voted for... Different candidates? Well, we, we, we have political engagements <laughs> okay. in our house. We sit down and mm. we have political discussions. Mm. I think the truth about it is that, again, going back to the question of women politically engaged, mm. I was on the road uh, driving and you see all these vendors when they come. And now I, I, I wanted to do an experiment, like, okay, let me see what this vendor will show me. And the first thing the vendor was showing me was one woman magazine with shape. And I told, I had to wind down and tell him, why are you showing me that one? Why would you show me the other one? He was showing me ovation, mm -hmm. ovation and all those things. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, I don't like looking at all those things because it's a waste of my time. But it just occurred to me that that is how our perception now. Sometimes we think that being involved in politics is just too much work on the brain. So, of course, yeah. I can sit back and ask my husband, oh, what do you think of Ambote or what do you think of Jimmy Akbati? But I am also able to come up with my own opinions. Mm. And the fact that my opinion and my husband's opinions differ is it could differ based on his own approach and background mm. and what he has. But, and I have a right to vote. You see, many women need to understand, and men also, that the fact that I don't follow you and what you believe in doesn't make me a bad person. God gave me a brain and I'm using it. Does it also have anything to do with the educational background of the woman in question? Education is important. Mm. Education has been shown to when women are more educated, certain things change. Just a minute. Let's check this out. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Call Digest. Are you there? What's your name again? Oliver. All right, please go ahead with your contribution. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Go ahead with the contribution, please. I think the problem we are having in Nigeria today is the problem of uh, uh, the Nigerian policies that are not supporting the women. I think we should support the women so that if the women are involved in politics, they will do more better than the men nowadays. Because the law is really encouraging them. It's all right. But, and I think that's also another very big issue, the idea that women need to be supported yes. to get a chance politically. Yes. If they are equal and if they are up to the task, do they need any extra support more than men? We must begin from the premise that we are on a, an uneven playing field. Okay. We are not... It, look, when it comes to, first and foremost, money, we will never have the account, the amount of... Well, we will have one day. <laughs> but we can never have the current, you know, the bags of money that are being thrown around in political participation. Mm. Let's face it. When it comes to years and years of experience, to be a woman politician or to be in politics, there are several skills you have to have. One is negotiation. It's a serious skill. And many times women do not know how to negotiate. Uh, my husband said, take the children to school. But I have something to do. Take them now. Okay. 
you need to learn how to negotiate. So mm. they say, okay, don't come out this year. Wait your turn. It's a turntable. Mm. You have been in the party for a long time. There's another candidate that wants to come. And, and you know that your people in your constituency want you. You know that you can pull votes. Every political party wants people that can pull votes, by the way. It's not as if, oh, we just want somebody fine face. Mm. We want people that will pull votes. You should be able to come to the table and say, you know what? I am bringing this, 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 this. There's no political party to what is on you that will not say, let us try this woman mm. or let us try that man. And so that is the issue. Women need to know that they need these skills or they have to have these skills. Hello, Hello good morning. What's your name? Uh, good morning, mm. family. What's your name, please? Salisu calling from Niger State. Please go ahead with your contribution, Salisu. Uh, um, um, I, like, uh, I like your guest. He's proving point. But okay. uh, I have uh, a little question and a little worry. I want to ask your guest. Uh, Madam, um, you know, we, um, in this democracy, they say if women were crying that uh, they have my, my marginalized women in, in, uh, in government, in democracy, women will cry up and down. Now, the present government of Jonathan Cohn and the cry of uh, 50%. Now we have uh, a lot of women in government today. But um, a lot of uh, women have become the arrow of corruption again in, in, in government. And uh, people like uh, Administration Minister, the Finance Minister, and we have Petroleum Minister, and they have a lot of uh, corruption allegations against them. So please, I want you to ask why women are, are trying to be arrow in, uh, arrowhead in, in corruption in Nigeria. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure you quickly want to react to that. Do I? <laughs> Do I? You know, the funny thing about it is that people say this all the time. I get mm. it all the time when I go. Oh, women are the most corrupt. We, we exist in an ecosystem. I really need him to understand that. We exist in a system whereby if there are no checks and balances, whether it is men or women, corru corruption thrives. Now, me, I'm not really saying that, oh, uh, the finance minister or the petroleum minister is not corrupt or is corrupt. The question I would like to throw to people also is that, show me which commissioner or minister is not corrupt. That's the question I would like to throw back. If you exist in a system that there is no accountability, there's no transparency, there's no check and balance, there's no punishment when you do something wrong. Of course, whether you are a man or a woman, you continue to push the envelope. And, you know, that is corruption. That is what corruption means, isn't it? Now, the question I want to also ask people is that, why do they hold women to a different standard than men? After all, I exist in this same culture that you exist. Mm -hmm. If you, it's okay for you to take 50,000, why can't I take 20,000? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pushing corruption. Please, everybody should understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that sometimes we have to critically understand that when a woman, and that's why we always say we want a critical mass of women, when a woman is in a situation, in, in a place where this is what entails, sometimes it is always hard to go against the green. Sometimes you need to be unpopular or you would be unpopular. I don't think that any of the ministers no, I, would, I won't say anymore. Let me just leave it that way. <laughs> the point of the matter is that we need to hold... Probably we've not had enough women to know whether they are truly corrupt or not. Is that what you're saying? Why don't they say the men are corrupt? Why don't they say that? Why didn't he point the name of one minister, man, that is corrupt? Let me because take they this. Are. Yes or no? Let me take this last call, and I hope it's a woman. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, what's He's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Please go ahead with the contribution, Pius. Uh, you see, the, the, women, the women were crying that they have been marginalized. But to be frank with you, although Doya Kulele was a pride for women, she redeemed the island in Nigerian politics. So nowadays, what is happening is becoming very insulting. The few women we had in this present dispensation, they did not measure well. Most of them became a disgrace. Taking from the woman, the minister for petroleum, look at the allegation against her. Look at Odua, the former minister for finance, uh, let me say, uh, aviation. Why are we talking about the minister for, for finance? 
So, if women will be used for as a tool to, to, to uh, as a tool for corruption, it will, it will, it will be, bring their image will have been battered. I think what they need to do is to come together and uh, maybe fine tune their image. Because look at what the, the president, uh, first lady, kept saying on the on the podium, insulting uh, an opposition, in making some utterances as a first lady. I I strongly support the opposition who said he's going to scrap the office of the first lady. In fact, let let the woman. Thank God, yesterday was a woman day. They should stick together, all their stakeholders, and make sure they, they, they caution themselves. It's all right. It's, I believe if we continue like this, it will not be good for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pius, from Abuja. I also want to believe that individual and partisan perception could have contributed to the evaluation that political or women in Nigerian politics are corrupt. You know, for instance, not everybody will agree that the Minister of Finance is corrupt and legally also you can call someone corrupt if such a person has not been called you know by a competent court thank but you I, I must also admit that i got carried away with you because um, i have all that guests waiting outside but are you planning to engage in partisan politics <laughs> well i do intend to uh run okay at some point in my life <laughs> In Delta State, because okay. I'm from Delta, or uh, Ogun State, it depends, because I can do both Delta and Ogun, but no, Delta State. Well, I, you're taking your time for now. Yes. Probably gaining some... Experience, some know-how, some, you know, insights, but like every person that wants to be involved in politics, I'm really questioning that, is this something that I want to go into? Gathering some money as well. Hell no. <laughs> like I never got enough money. I, you need to understand. We need to sanitize mm. what the political situation is like. We need to sanitize the political arena. We need to create more people like you okay. and me that go in there. And it's not about the money, but about actually creating a change for our people. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I hope that um, before you go, you also give us some contacts to some other women that we can talk Already to on done the show. So. Okay. Oh, you already did that. Yes. Fantastic. Emi Oyewale, Executive Oyekule, I beg your pardon. As some of us have wrote your name wrongly on yes, the internet because so. I'm reading these directly from one of the blogs. Emi Oyekule is the Executive Director yes. of Kudarat Initiative for Democracy. She's a gender activist and she also just unveiled to us that she's a politician in the making. <laughs> so you might want to find out more about her to know whether you'll be voting for her what she finally decides. Thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you very much. We hope you. that subsequently you also find time to join us on Call Digest. Anytime. We'll take a break now, and when we come back, we'll turn attention uh, to some more very specific political activities that took place during the weekend. Of course, um, INEC did a mock test on the card readers. Some men will be joining us, and we'll be talking serious politics. Stick around. Don't go away. From time immemorial, women have bet life, shaped character, and by extension, influenced the society. Morimi of Ife, and Moten of Benin, Queen Aminat of Zaria, all women of influence and power. Whether it's before election, after election. How ironical, women being so powerful, yet have few grounds in decision making. They see you as weak, and I see you as a wife to a man. We are talking women in politics. A woman will be bold enough to stand up and say, I want to become president of Nigeria. Only on Core TV News.